Obsolescence is a fact of life in the 21st century. Your old 32-bit tablet can't run apps anymore, your old printer hasn't had a driver update since Windows 7, and modern laptops need dongles, hubs, and external drives just to fit in with your pre-existing workflow. The PC industry has built entire edifices on the flakiest of foundations, but the one that concerns us today relates to graphics cards. A decade ago, games tech was coming along in leaps and bounds, and GPUs were struggling to keep up. The solution for those looking to gain even a measure of future-proofing in such chaotic times was to stack multiple GPUs, either through AMD's Crossfire or Nvidia's SLI. By harnessing the power of two or more discrete graphics processors, enthusiasts in the 2000s and early 2010s could run the latest games at max settings and still be confident of good performance in the future. Despite the enormous cost of multiple graphics cards, a compatible motherboard, and a PSU to power everything, it would all be worth it in the long run. Foreshadowing is a narrative device. The GTX 690 was among the later examples of a now-forgotten kind of graphics card. On this single PCB was soldered a pair of top-end GK104 GPUs, acting like a pair of GTX 680s linked over SLI. To the casual user, a graphics card like the GTX 690 had obvious benefits over a more conventional multi-GPU setup. Although it probably wouldn't double the performance of a GTX 680, given the reductions needed to scale this card to a 300W TDP, it was still significantly more powerful than any other NVIDIA graphics card at the time. Practically speaking, this single-card SLI solution didn't require the use of any external bridges, had high but manageable PSU requirements, and didn't present the heat issues that a GPU sandwich could potentially suffer from. To a power user, the GTX 690 had other benefits. The very wealthiest could use cards like the GTX 690 for four-way or even six-way SLI setups, though given the inevitable reduction in performance scaling and the likelihood of a CPU limit, this was really just a flex. Still, anyone looking for maximum performance could appreciate a less obvious advantage of the GTX 690. By having the two GK104s communicate directly rather than over an external bridge, this meant that the full bandwidth of the PCIe x16 slot was being utilised. While HEDT platforms had enough bandwidth to allow two slots to operate at full speed, most consumer Intel and AMD platforms could only handle multiple slots at times 8 speeds. Whether or not this difference is actually noticeable, or whether the potential benefits of this extra bandwidth are offset by the reduced clock speeds compared to using separate cards, is another matter. To get an idea of why the GTX 690 seemed like a good idea back in 2012, and at what point it started to turn sour, I'll be testing using my usual GPU test rig, the moderately priced gaming PC. This setup runs a Ryzen 5 5600G overclocked to 4.6GHz with 16GB of DDR4-3600 on an MSI Tomahawk Max B450 motherboard powered by an EVGA 750W gold rated PSU. I probably don't mention this often enough given that I'm supposed to be doing this whole YouTube thing as a business, but there's Amazon affiliate links in the description to the components used in case anything takes your fancy. The sequel to the original PC Melter, Crisis 2 represented a less frustrating experience for PC enthusiasts. Unlike the first Crisis, GPUs available at the time could actually play the game with some acceptably high settings. The GTX 680 and 690 released a year after Crisis 2 hit shelves, and on paper at least, either GPU was sufficient to run at 1080 with max quality settings, with a single GPU able to run at a 60 plus average, and the dual GPU card scaling almost perfectly to 113 FPS. This didn't necessarily reflect a perfect experience, however. I found neither the single nor double GPU config gave a genuinely smooth experience, with even the high frame rate of the fully unleashed 690 not really feeling like a high frame rate experience. To be fair to the hardware, this was the only game I tested that felt like this, and I don't have that much experience with Crisis 2, so it's possible that this is a software issue rather than a hardware one.
The biggest release of 2011 was The Elder Scrolls Skyrim, a game which is designed to work with a 60fps lock, though that can be negated fairly easily in Nvidia's control panel. I hear the physics can act up if you run above the 60fps mark, though I didn't really play long enough to notice any issues of that kind. What I did notice on both the single GPU run and the double GPU run was a lot of f flickering. I actually ran the dual GPU config first and so naturally assumed it was an issue related to using SLI, but seeing it reoccur with the second GPU disabled made me reconsider that. Given that the game is intended to lock at 60, choosing a GTX 690 over a 680 would have been a meaningless flex for anyone running at 1080 or lower, as both cards would net over 100 FPS at max settings. The last time I tested Far Cry 3 with the GTX 690, it was in the context as part of the first ever 4K gaming PC, and it wasn't really up to the challenge. At 1080 things are a lot more realistic for both the 690 and its single chip cousin. A GTX 680 owner could happily run max settings at over 60 FPS on average, with 1% lows just below 50. The addition of a second GK104 doesn't scale quite as perfectly as with Crisis 2, but the performance difference is very much noticeable. Averages are now up over 110, and 1% lows push above 65. High refresh LCD monitors were extremely uncommon in 2012. In fact, I think there might have only been one, but even at 60 or 75 hertz, the smoother frame tracing should have been appreciable. 2013's Tomb Raider was one of the most popular benchmarking titles of the era, and it's not hard to see why. The game has a ton of features that were intensive enough to make GPUs of the time sweat with the effort. Notably the TressFX hair physics engine, which could bring lesser GPUs to their knees. Anyone looking to run a single GTX 680 with TressFX enabled would likely have had to tolerate sub-60 average frame rates and pretty appalling 1% lows. While the SLI card doesn't completely resolve the frame pacing, it does increase averages by an almost perfect 100%. I'd say that disabling TressFX would have been a fairly uncontroversial solution, and it would certainly have allowed even the single GPU card to run at a close to 60 average, but for those of you who just love to see that flowing, slightly glitchy hair in motion, the GTX 690 was worth every penny of the extra $500 you'd have paid. 2014's Shadow of Mordor actually performs pretty close to Tomb Raider in many respects. At 1080 max settings, a single GK104 can manage about the same 50fps average that is the ideal frame rate for gaming. Screw NTSC, pal for life baby! 1% <clears throat> lows aren't impressive, dipping below 30 just a little too often. Adding the second GPU doesn't quite double frame rates, but it's still pretty close, jumping about 80% on average, delivering 90fps with 1% lows of over 48. The first of my 2015 titles, GTA V, was a port of a two-year-old game at the time, so despite the extra visual tweaks, it shouldn't be too surprising that a high-end 2012 GPU could run it just fine. Although the 2GB frame buffer did mean I couldn't push all the settings up to very high, with a few tweaks it was possible to get the GTX 680 equivalent to run the game at over 80fps at 1920x1080, with lows just above that 50fps sweet spot. Adding the second GPU takes things up a notch, and could potentially drive a 1440 display at a smooth 50+, plus, but at 1080 it averages about 135. High enough to give a super smooth experience, but not so high as to encounter the engine limit that starts making the game stutter. The Witcher 3, however, is another story. A single GTX 680 can't handle this game at its highest settings and still deliver a smooth frame rate at 1080. This is, of course, down to Hairworks, the super realistic hair simulation mode that absolutely hammers frame rates. Even without Hairworks, however, this is a pretty rough run for the 680. It only averaged 30 FPS in my testing, and I didn't even get as far as Novigrad. If you were gaming on a GTX 680 in 2015, this might have been one of the few games that had you reaching for the medium quality preset. If you had the 690 however, things looked a lot rosier. Ultra quality with hairworks enabled was still painful to behold, averaging the low 40s, 
but simply disabling that one pointless feature delivered a silky smooth 58 FPS, almost 100% higher than the single card. For the first three years or so of the GTX 690's existence, it functioned pretty much as you'd have hoped. Realistically though, 2016 is about the time anyone holding this card would have been looking to drop it. As time moved on, the flaws in SLI in general, and the GTX 690 in particular, were becoming evident. You see, this card had two fatal flaws, the first being the Kepler architecture of the GK104 GPUs. Kepler would prove to be somewhat maligned by audiences. Unlike later cards from AMD and Nvidia themselves, it didn't support DX12.0 or 12.1 features, and while it did support Mantle, the API that would eventually become Vulkan, it didn't perform anywhere close to its competitors. This inadequate API support, along with a lack of asynchronous compute and only 2GB of addressable VRAM, meant the GK104 wouldn't age gracefully. And that's only half of the card's problems. The other half is the technology that makes the whole GTX 690 work, SLI. By 2016, the multi-GPU meta was living on borrowed time. An increasing number of games lacked any support for SLI at all, and those that did couldn't get anywhere near the performance two such GPUs should theoretically be capable of. Hardware aside, if any game tested so far today were going to be stuck at 30 FPS, you'd be glad it was Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice. This game looks too good to drop to low settings, but it doesn't demand a high frame rate for you to enjoy it. That being said, considering only two years previously the GTX 680 could run AAA games at 50 FPS or higher, 28 FPS definitely feels like a really steep drop in performance. SLI isn't the saviour you'd hope for either. Averages on the fully enabled GTX 690 jump by only 10-15% to over a single GPU setup. Three years earlier, the GTX 690 was running GTA 5 so fast, you had to turn quality up to make sure it didn't hit the frame rate cap. In 2018's Shadow of the Tomb Raider, you'd need to drop quality to medium just to maintain a playable FPS. The single GPU would run at 33 FPS with lows in the high 20s. Adding the second GPU once more only gives about a 20% boost in performance, averaging 38 FPS. Chronologically, Jedi Fallen Order is one of the last games released to fully support SLI, and from the evidence of the last two games, I didn't have high hopes. As it turns out, scaling was much better than I'd expected. The single GTX 680 config could manage a 43 FPS average at 1080 medium. Enabling the second GPU brings a pretty healthy 40% increase in frame rates, almost hitting 60 FPS on average. 1% lows were pretty bad, but this game suffers from heavy loading stutters that even Digital Foundry found objectionable in their full review, using a much newer GPU than this one. So far we've seen two sides of the SLI coin. Games that scale well, and games that don't. Well, it turns out that SLI is a weird shaped coin, with three sides. Or maybe these are a case of a coin landing on its edge? I don't know, I didn't really think this metaphor through. Fortnite represents possibly a worst case scenario of SLI scaling, that is, negative performance. A single GTX 680 at 1080 in DX11 with competitive quality settings can score a comfortable 90fps average with 60fps 1% lows. Nothing earth shattering, but good enough for casual play without any major distracting performance issues. Turning the second GPU on, sees performance cut in half. No, actually worse than that, 1% and 0.1% lows fall down a drain and into the sewer. Frames don't render in a smooth continuous flow, but gallop out two at a time. Whether newer GPUs can handle SLI better, I don't know. Maybe a crossfire test will work out better, but in the meantime, GTX 690s should be left in single GPU mode in this game. To a lesser extent, Apex Legends suffers the same fate, but with a whole new awful side effect. Turning on SLI in Apex treats you to a real-time simulation of what it must be like to have an epileptic fit. I'm not going to say this makes Apex unplayable. I can't play Apex anyway, it's not the fault of any particular hardware, I just suck at the game. 
the point is, even the best players would find it hard to play in these conditions. Factor in the very small amount of negative performance scaling, and SLI is just an SLI ability in this title. This is a turning point in this video. From now on, none of the games tested support SLI at all. There may be titles here and there that I've missed or forgotten about, but from this point on, the results will be indistinguishable from a stock GTX 680. 2018's Battlefield 5 pulls just under 60 FPS on average at 1080 low, with 1% lows of 40. Red Dead Redemption 2 has something of an authoritarian take on low-spec gaming, severely curtailing your ability to change quality settings on a card with only 2 gigs of VRAM. As a result, I was forced to run the game at 720. Trying to compensate by pushing the quality slider to balance was apparently okay, the menu indicated that this would be permitted, but in practice, very few textures loaded up and the game looked like ass. Dropping quality to performance did little to improve matters visually, and performance was limited to just above 30 FPS on average. Cyberpunk 2077 would have been a good fit for an SLI rig. Alas, like everything else released in 2020, there doesn't seem to be any way of making it work with multiple GPUs. The 680 on its own isn't up to the task. At 720 low, my standard test run only managed 20 FPS, with lows of 11. At risk of enraging the low-spec community, I'm going to go out on a limb and call this unplayable. And if Cyberpunk was unplayable, then I think we need a new word for Spider-Man Remastered. While swinging through Manhattan, the game periodically stops to let you enjoy the view while it loads in textures and assets. <laughs> this is... Well, it's pretty funny, sure, but also kind of sad. A $1,000 flagship GPU reduced to waiting while the brickwork loads in. And that's just the games that started. God of War requires DX11-1. Elden Ring requires DX12-0, as does Halo Infinite. And while Forza Horizon 5 used to work with older architectures like Kepler, apparently a game update nerfed that feature a few months ago. These four, and an increasing number of others, won't start on Kepler-based GPUs without taking more drastic action. Even those that do start won't be optimised for Kepler, as driver support for this family of cards was terminated in 2021, meaning the GTX 680 and 690 are at something of a dead end. At this point, I wanted to bring in some context, because with the exception of games that flat out don't work, it's possible to look at these numbers and think, that it could be worse, that the GTX 690 wasn't a bad purchase and that maybe I'm being unreasonable expecting it to last this long. The Radeon HD7970 was launched by AMD four months before the GTX 680 and six months before the 690. As well as benefiting from AMD's much vaunted fine wine updates over the last decade or so, this card had DX11-1 feature support, asynchronous compute and an extra gigabyte of VRAM. As a result, God of War not only starts, but actually can run at a steady 30 FPS. Fortnite runs a little slower than the 680 at 80 FPS rather than 90, but Apex runs twice as fast on the AMD as the GeForce. Cyberpunk isn't just playable at 720, it's playable at 1080. A pair of HD 7970s, or the 7990 released in 2013, would probably still have suffered the same multi-GPU woes as the 690 did, but the GCN card's more forward-looking architecture and RAM configuration seems to have lent it at least a little more utility over the last decade. But lest we descend into tribalism, what about Nvidia? If you'd sold your GTX 690 in 2014, a single GTX 980 could have been the wisest purchase you could have made. The original Maxwell card would not only have been able to run all those games that didn't start on the 690, it would have done a pretty good job of it too. Fortnite and Apex run more than twice as fast on the 980 as on the 690. Spider-Man not only runs faster, but at much higher settings and without having to stop to load stuff. RDR2? Twice the pixels, twice the frame rate, and far higher quality all round. Plus, if your money really had been burning a hole in your pocket, you could always have bought a second card. We can all learn from the fate of the 690. 
We've been pretty fortunate that the last four generations of GPU, over nine years, are all still supported in the latest games. The shortages of the last couple of years have shown how fragile this state of affairs can be. There is no such thing as true future-proofing. You never know when a GPU manufacturer facing hard times is going to be forced to restructure or lay off its legacy driver development team. You never know when a seemingly innocuous feature of a GPU architecture suddenly becomes the arbiter of whether you can play a new game or not. And you never know when a piece of proprietary tech that was promised as a revolution will be forgotten within a couple of years or made obsolete by a vastly superior successor. What advice can I give? Well, in my head I've created a straw man, the PC enthusiast who bought a GTX 690 and then held onto it for a decade, watching its value dwindle with each passing game release until it's valued only by collectors and nerds like me. In truth, I don't know how many of these buyers are out there today who spend a grand on a GPU, expecting it to last them for 10 years or more, but my advice to them would be to pay attention. If you must spend that much money on a graphics card, try not to become too attached to it. Sometimes when we're attached to something we've spent a lot of money on, we go out of our way to defend it against perceived attackers. I'm sure plenty of people warned that SLI was a dying technology for gaming, and that Kepler was a flawed architecture, and that 2GB of VRAM wouldn't be enough going forwards. Someone who owned a GTX 90 but listened to its critics could have made a wise decision and sold when it still had some value. I plan on looking at Kepler one last time, as I try to use some workarounds to play otherwise incompatible games, so keep your eyes peeled for that video in the next few weeks. I'll also be building a follow-up to my original 4K gaming PC, this time using an AMD Crossfire multi-GPU setup. When that video goes live, it'll be linked on screen now. In the meantime, here's that video where I see how the GTX 690 performed as the first sort of 4K gaming GPU. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.